My name is Dot. I'm 22 years old and I'm from North Dakota. I have a lot of tattoos as well. I got my first when I was 17 actually. Shout out to the tattoo artist who knew the idea was not mine, but still inked me up anyway. After that, I was pretty much hooked. I got a sleeve over the course of about 9 months during my late teens. Got my neck covered with a skull and flower motif. I got a wolf covering pretty much my entire right thigh. I even got a small face tattoo. Provocative, I know. But in for a penny, in for a pound, as they say. I know some people look at me and think I'm some kind of trashy meth head loser or something. But once you get to know me, I'm nothing like that. I'm a thoughtful person whose ink has no bearing on their actual personality. I'm also a great babysitter. I love to take care of kids, and all the families whose kids I took care of learned that for themselves by taking a chance with me. Maybe that makes me sound kind of full of myself, but I hope it doesn't. I'd like to think it's fully justified, given some of the cruel things that have happened to me because of my tattoos over the years. And that also brings me to my next point. I'm not going to say I'm the prettiest girl in the world or anything, but for some reason my tattoos seem to elicit a certain kind of effect from some people. I don't want to go into too much about those with detail. I'm sure you can guess if you apply a little imagination. I really, really hate some of the comments people make when they see my ink though. At best, it's just annoying and people get the message when I tell them to stick their non-compliments where the sun don't shine. At worst though, men can get very frightening when they're not used to being told no, and this story involves one of those cases. In May of 2019, I was on my way to one of my regular babysitting jobs on a humid Friday night. I needed to stop up quickly at a gas station to top up my tank. I live in a quite rural area, and despite this gas station being a pretty regular stop for me, it was the only one for miles and miles around. Because of this, while it certainly had a fair share of regulars, it also got plenty of visitors who weren't from the area, sometimes not even from the Rough Rider country at all. They're all just passing through. I'm guessing this particular guy was passing through as well. I'd never seen him before, and he was wearing some sort of sports team cap. I don't know if it was because I was hungry or just in a grouchy mood, but when he started making comments my way, I gave him the business, and particularly harshly as well. I told him I was probably his daughter's age, assuming anyone let him have one, and asked how he'd like it if some guy started talking to his girl the way he was talking to me. He then made some comment about how he'd never let his daughter, guessing he did have one because of this, quote unquote, ruin her body the way I had. And comments like that used to hurt me a lot. Not anymore so often, but back then at the time, I told him to go jump in a lake. A nicer version of what I actually said. But I don't want to get anyone in trouble if they're repeating this story. I paid for my gas and drove off after. I didn't think I was being followed. But then again, I don't think I looked in my rear view the whole drive there. Like I said, I live in a pretty rural area. And unless you pass through a small town or whatever, there's not much need to actually check your rear view while you're out on the main highways. When I got to the place I was babysitting at, I had no idea of what was about to befall me that night. Not a single clue. So it was with blissful ignorance that I parked my car, knocked on the door, and went inside to chat with the mom and say hi to the little man. A few hours went by and I mostly occupied myself by playing Nintendo Switch with the little guy and deliberately losing to make him feel good about himself. You know how that sort of thing tends to go. Not that I'm any good anyway. Sometimes I didn't even have to pretend to lose, but it brought me a lot of joy to see him so happy about winning. Anyway, at about 9pm, which was way later than his regular bedtime, but I let him stay past a little bit, I took the little guy to bed and read him a story until he was soundly snoozing. After that, I helped myself to some of the leftovers that the mom had left for me. I settled into the couch to watch some TV and talk to my friends, when right about then I heard a knock at the door. I got up to see who was there, kind of nervous about who it would be at this time of night. I still didn't want to just ignore it though, just in case it was something important. When I looked out to check, there was no one there. 
Kids play pranks sometimes, right? Even though it's a rural area where the houses are sometimes half a mile apart, it could have easily been a bunch of kids who cycled over just to get up to no good. That's what I told myself anyway. I'm not the type to freak out over a game of ding-dong ditch, so I just closed the door and muttered something about dumb kids under my breath, then went back to watching TV. Not long after that, though, it happened again. Only, the knocking on the door was even louder this time, and kind of interspersed too, almost like someone was kicking the door or something. I got really mad, thinking they were going to wake the little guy upstairs, in which case it would be super difficult to get him back to sleep. That time, I opened the door, took a few steps outside, and looked around to see if anyone was watching or hiding in the darkness. There was no one in sight, but I definitely wanted whoever was doing this to stop doing it. In a voice, I tried to keep low enough to not wake the kid upstairs, but loud enough for anyone close by to hear. I told whoever it was that if they did that again, I'd be calling the cops soon after. In the moments after I spoke, nothing moved and nothing stirred either. There was just this dead silence in the air, which actually started to give me a bit of the creeps. After a while, it was quite obvious that whoever had done this was still quite close by. I didn't hear any shuffling around or voices or anything like that, but I could tell someone was there watching me. Feeling pretty exposed, I turned around to walk back inside the house. I can't even really describe the kind of terror I felt when I turned around and saw that sports cap staring me in the face. Even with all the lessons in writing I've had, I'm struggling to find the words to describe that sensation. All that cliche stuff like my blood ran cold or a shiver ran up my spine. And they sound like something out of a campfire story compared to what actual heart-pounding terror feels like. I felt my heart just thumping a mile a minute and I felt this alarm bell feeling in my head. I was outside now, alone with this guy, who'd followed me home from the gas station. Maybe the guy even thought this is where I lived. Next thing I knew, his big calloused hand flew up towards my throat, and I felt almost all my air being cut off. I started to make these scary wheezing noises, just to get the air into my lungs. I remember how my hand shot up to his wrist, trying to pull his hand away from my throat, but he was way too strong for me to even budget. I kicked out at him and tried to land it where it would hurt him the most, but my first and only effort landed on his thigh. After that, he held me out at arm's length, so I couldn't reach him. Every time I tried to kick him again, I not only missed completely, but he squeezed a little harder for a second so I couldn't breathe at all. In the end, I was basically just hanging there, feet only touching the ground because I was on my tiptoes. He started smiling at me. I don't want to repeat exactly what he said because it was so disgusting, but I remember every freaking word. To paraphrase, he basically said a girl like me should know better than to talk to a man like I had, and he'd take a great deal of pleasure in teaching me a lesson I should have learned years ago. He made some comment about how he'd had to wait quite a while to make sure I was home alone, but he was glad that he did, because now no one would be able to stop him. Like I said, I don't want to quote him fully, but he was extremely graphic about what he was going to do. I can barely describe the feelings that boiled up inside me, knowing he was about to do this right there to me in the driveway. Honestly, the only consolation was that I might not have to be awake for it, because breathing was so hard by that point, I was about to pass out. The guy then basically threw me onto the front lawn, which was slightly out of sight of the road outside thanks to this big hedge the family had been cultivating over the years. The entire North Dakota Highway Patrol could have driven by and I don't think they would have seen a thing. I was screwed in more ways than one. Right as the guy was standing over me, I heard a little voice bark out from the doorway of the house. It was the kid I was babysitting. The little man had somehow woken up during everything that was going on heard the guy talking and headed downstairs to see what was happening. I don't know what went through the guy's head after seeing the little kid watching what he was about to do. Like I said earlier, I'm almost certain he had kids of his own, but it was enough to make him think twice. He backed up a little and told me I was the luckiest little girl on the face of the earth, then started telling the kid I was babysitting that he was helping me up because I'd fallen down. The kid didn't buy it for a second though, I've always been amazed at how brave he was in that moment, 
as he once again let out an impossibly loud yell for how small he was. I was already scrambling back towards the house by the time the guy started walking out of the driveway. All I had going through my head was to get a 911 dispatcher to listen as I read out the guy's license plate. I didn't know where he was parked, but it had to be close by. All I needed to do was get my phone fast enough, and I'd be able to get this guy arrested. Sadly, I was not fast enough. By the time I rushed back out into the road outside, all we could see was a flash of the guy's rear lights in the distance before they faded into nothingness. I managed to tell the dispatcher as much as I could, including what he looked like in the stretch of highway I figured he might be driving down, but since I had no idea what type of car he was driving, I guess it wasn't enough for the cops to get him on a traffic stop or anything. After the call ended, I tried my best to protect the little guy from the horrifying truth of what just happened, but he was smart enough to know that a bad man had come to the house. For a few moments, the both of us had been in a terrifying amount of danger. He was still awake when his mom and dad got home, but they could instantly tell something bad had happened. Their only issue was that I hadn't called to tell them, but I just didn't want to ruin one of their rare date nights, given no one actually got hurt. I mean, I had one heck of a bruise around my throat the next day. But aside from that, everyone was pretty much unscathed. Now that I look back on it, I don't think the guy ever really had the intention of killing me or anything. If he was psycho enough to do something like that, I don't think he would have really cared if a kid was watching. I just think having a teen girl give him disrespect made him really angry. Maybe he was having just a bad enough day that he felt like taking some spite out on me or something. I don't know. Then again, I've always been inclined to see the best in people, and I'm still something of a perennial optimist, so maybe I'm wrong in that instinct. Back when I was a kid, I had this regular babysitter who was the daughter of one of my dad's co-workers. I kind of hated her at the time. She was terrible at her job. I had other babysitters who I actually liked, so I knew she was terrible. She seemed like she didn't want to be there at all. She was also super strict with me, overzealously carrying my parents' rules to the letter as a way of taking out her spite on me. I got used to doing things like having to call downstairs first if I even wanted to get a glass of water after bedtime, not even daring to turn on my nightlight because she made me sleep with my door open so she could check every 30 minutes. It sounds harsh, I know, but my parents had always been pretty strict too. I guess my dad's co-worker figured their influence, as well as the responsibility, would do her some good. Anyway, this one night when she arrived, she seemed quite different. I remember my mom and dad, the poor naive souls, were telling her that it was okay if she didn't feel well and wanted to be driven back home. She refused, telling them she was just a little bit tired and would take a nap once I'd been put down to bed. Boy, did she really seem tired too. She was nodding out as I was eating dinner, was way, way laxer than she usually was. I remember thinking that if she was like this every time she babysat me in the future, I wouldn't have to dread her arrival anymore. She actually forgot to put me to bed on time too. I got like 45 minutes of extra TV while she napped on the couch. For a while, she was actually sleeping with her phone held up near her face. I thought it was the funniest thing at the time, but if I had known what was actually going on, I wouldn't have thought it so amusing. A few hours later, I woke up incredibly thirsty. I stuck my head out into the hallway and started calling out to her, asking permission to come downstairs and get a glass of water, as we agreed to. For the first time since she'd ever started babysitting me, there was no reply when I called her name. No, oh my god, what do you want now? No, go back to sleep, jeez. Nothing like that. It was complete silence, other than the low hum of the TV from downstairs. I could just feel something was off, but I couldn't tell what exactly. I headed downstairs to try and find her. I grew up in quite a big home, one with an upstairs and a downstairs bathroom. The downstairs bathroom door was only ever closed when it was being used. That clued me into the fact that she must be in there right now. I stood there at the door for a while, actually kind of worried about how much trouble I'd get in for being downstairs after bedtime. But then it hit me. 
something had seemed off that night, that she wasn't feeling well. Maybe she was in some kind of trouble herself. I knocked on the door, called out her name again, only to find the door actually opened a little under the force of my knock. People always lock the door when they use the bathroom, don't they? I knew something was wrong here, so I pushed the door open. I saw her sitting there, toilet lid down and slumped back, with something sticking out of her arm. I didn't even recognize it for what it really was in the moment. I didn't know anything about drugs back then. The only needles I'd ever seen were with me facing away from it and wincing, so it's not like I recognized right off the bat. I thought she was just asleep. I mean, I honestly thought she was napping. She was leaning back against the toilet completely slumped over. Any grown-up in their right mind would have known something was wrong right away, but she just looked so peaceful. So peaceful I didn't want to wake her. I just got my glass of water, then went back to drift back off to sleep. Next thing I know, I was woken up to the sound of my mom screaming. Then the rest of the night was kind of a blur for me. The flash of blue and red lights outside. The phone calls and weeping and wailing. Then, almost equally worse, was how my mom and dad seemed to try and forget the whole thing. I think they did so for my sake, so I wouldn't realize how my inaction had actually killed this girl. If I had called someone, they say she would have still been alive, but there's no way I could have known that back then. I'm currently traveling Southeast Asia with my two brothers. We arrived in Saigon this morning. In the evening after dinner and a few beers, me and my two brothers, older and younger, I'm the middle one, decided to sit on a bench in Haodan Park and have a quick smoke. We were chatting away, sat on the bench there, when I noticed a Vietnamese man. He was repeatedly looking over at us, walking in circles over and over very near where we were sitting. At first, I wasn't too concerned about him. However, my spider senses were alerted very soon. A minute or two later after I'd first observed him, I noticed another Vietnamese man dressed as a delivery driver, acting suspicious as well, repeatedly glancing over at me and my brothers. The two men were both on the phone. I believe they must have been communicating with each other. Being in a foreign country, my younger brother wanted us to leave. However, it was a good 600 meter walk to the park exit. As we were walking, I noticed both of the Vietnamese men had gotten onto mopeds and were following us on different paths through the park, stopping behind trees and watching us. At some point, they disappeared out of sight. It seemed they'd overtaken us because they were sitting at a bench further down the path waiting for us to cross by. Being aware of this, we left the path and started walking on the grass to the nearest exit as the crow flies. We did our best to avoid the men. We were 100 meters away from the exit when my younger brother looked behind us to see one of the men now sprinting towards us. My younger brother took a fighting stance. He stood his ground against the man and called out to ask what he wanted. Instantly, the man's posture became very small and he began talking quietly. Both my brother and I kept a good distance and told the man to leave us alone as we walked backwards toward the exit. At that point, we noticed the second assailant also approaching us from a different direction, wearing some motorcycle gear now. My oldest brother decided instead of trying to get out of the situation, he was going to get closer to the whispering Vietnamese man to hear what he was saying. Both me and my younger brother were yelling at him to get the fuck out of here, but he wanted to be a dumbass. It took the Vietnamese guy five seconds to explain and win over my older brother's trust. Out of nowhere, when he was leaning in close trying to hear what the man was saying, the Vietnamese man reached out. He grabbed my brother's crotch and started hitting him. He was shocked. I was expecting a fight to break out and be robbed or something. The dong hits were super unexpected. After that, we started shouting, and the men fled immediately. For context, both me and my younger brother our MMA practiced fighters. The whole situation was so unexpected. We didn't engage in any violence towards the men ourselves, just shouting at them. At the end of the story, it was quite wild. Be careful in the parks at night in Vietnam. And to the dong grabbers, I hope we don't meet again.
I, female and 22, was parked on the side street of my house with my friend, who was also a woman. I lived next to a dead end road. The road faces two other houses, and all my neighbors parked their cars there. My friend didn't want to be rude to my family and block them in with her car, so she'd parked on the right side of the street. My neighbor has a trailer, the kind you hook onto the back of your car. My friend lives with her parents and she switches the cars that she uses quite frequently. We were in her dad's old beater Toyota Camry. I didn't get out of the car immediately because I wanted to talk for a little while before I went inside. All of a sudden, my neighbor pulled right up next to our car. He got out of the car and started walking towards us. I know that we made the wrong decision when this happened, but we were afraid. It was after dark, we were both girls, and this was a heavy set large man just to give you a description. My friend reversed and got out of there as he continued to approach us. Her intention was to drive somewhere else and wait for a while before dropping me off. She didn't want me walking inside alone while the guy was still out there. I agreed and we turned the street to leave, only that's not what happened. What did happen is that right after we turned, we saw another car following us. At first, we figured it was just another random car, until we realized it was the very same guy in the same truck. We proceeded to drive across town trying to lose him as he honked his horn and turned his high beams at us, driving on our ass the whole time. We called the police soon after he'd started chasing us, and my friend started driving over to the police station while we were on the phone with the operator. We pulled into the parking lot of the station. The man actually followed us in. We proceeded to drive in circles around the parking lot. About three or four times, he tried to hit us with his car in the lot too. He did this until an officer showed up and blocked him in. We both parked and started talking to the officer. Apparently, because we were in an old beater car and we were parked behind his trailer, he was convinced we were trying to steal from him or something. He was still screaming as he was parked, and the officer was trying to talk to him. The officer told us it was a misunderstanding, and told us to simply go home. We went back with me and my friend's mother to the police station, to ask about having the officers patrol his area for a while. I'm currently in my house, and this happened in the evening around 10pm-ish. My neighbor got off with a simple warning, and he's back home next door like nothing happened. I don't think I'll be sleeping very well tonight. I know I can't really do anything, because he lives right next door. I'm afraid to seek further action in case he gets violent, since he knows where I live. I don't know if he actually thought we were gonna steal from him or what. Maybe he's on drugs or just crazy. But I don't think it's normal to chase people you think are stealing from you across the city, 